about this work is that you know we come in with this font of knowledge and it, it almost appears like it just was delivered yesterday or last week or whatever. You know, we've been doing this work for 10 years. In Pennsylvania, it's been 10 years. 10 years for 100 communities to move forward and pass law. Um, in terms of that record, you know, what's happened in New Hampshire may has happened fairly quickly. But, I mean, we started, we, we don't tell the story usually at the, unless we have a long time to tell, but the, we started as a conventional environmental law firm. I mean, our job was to appeal permits. That's what we did for four years, from 1995 to 1998, 1999. And so we went in circles and chased our tails. I mean, we did really, we were really good at it. We would go in and find the omissions and gaps in the permit application, measure it up against state law, go and argue to the judges. We had a win-loss record of like 150 and three, something like that. But what would happen is the corporation would just keep coming back and submitting new applications, and eventually they would put in whatever they wanted to put in. And what was funny is that that process, the permanent appeal process, really reinforced in people that, that we have a democracy. Because it gave them a place to participate, even though it was two hands tied behind their back and they eventually lost anyway. As we saw with the regulatory systems, like a triangle, you start at the broad side and then the system drives you down into this really narrow point that we call the regulatory point. So when people were dealing with Walmart, for example, they couldn't talk about Walmart putting the downtown out of business because that's not a legitimate thing to talk about in the permit appeals. All you can talk about is what the hours the dock lighting are going to be on and how many trucks can come into the community at a given time. And so that's how the system works to basically winnow like cattle down a chute. And at the bottom, you know, you get the bolt shot through your head at the slaughterhouse. I mean, that's basically what happens with the community groups that we were dealing with. And so we said we're going to close because we're not doing anybody any good. And then we got pulled into this new area. And the first ordinances we did just had, you know, no factory farms. You know, and then the Smithfield Foods Corporation would come in and threaten to sue the municipality. And they'd always threaten to sue them the same way. They'd always come in and say, okay, number one, we're persons under the law, and therefore you're violating our constitutional rights. Number two, you're preempted by the state. Number three, you don't have the authority to do what you want to do in the first place because the state hasn't given it to you. And it was always those three. It didn't matter whether it was mining or, or development or water extraction or factory farms or sludging. It didn't matter. It, the companies came in and they said the same thing, which is so funny to me because I was used to going to conferences where you would get organized by subject. So you'd walk in as a conference attendee, like an environmental conference, and the timber activists would be in this room, the water folks would be in this room. I mean, we censor ourselves. We, we actually do it to ourselves. We say all these issues are different. I work on forestry issues. I work on water. Well, it's all the same freaking thing, which is it doesn't matter what you work on because you don't make the decisions anyway. And so there's these structural hurdles that kept bopping us, to which we said, well, shit, if that's what's used to cream these people, then we should start drafting ordinances that are actually frontally challenge those doctrines. Because that's the only way to make a fight that's about water into something else. Otherwise, it just stays about water. And we lose, because then it becomes about part per million or gallons pulled out or whatever else. But structurally, we don't have the authority to make those decisions anyway. And so, the challenge here, and the reason why the corporate boys leave our communities alone, for the most part, uh, is because you know not one new factory farm, not one new teaspoonful of sludge in those communities that have passed these ordinances in Pennsylvania for the last eight years uh, in those parts of PA, is that they come in, and I hesitate to use this phrase because it's gotten a really bad reputation, but you're setting up a tar baby for them when they come in. Because it used to be, you know, Nestle comes in, it's about water, and they have the water experts, they have the hydrogeologists, they write the ordinances for the community, they do all that stuff. As long as it's about water, they win. But these ordinances are about changing it from being about water to being about rights. And whether the rights of eight people sitting on a board of directors 3,000 miles away trumps the rights of 5,000 people in the community to make decisions on their own. And when it gets into rights, it becomes very unstable. It's very stable from a capital perspective when you're dealing with water or with forests, forestry or clear cutting or whatever you're dealing with. It's very stable for them. But when it gets into the right stuff, they don't know what it's releasing. They, do, they don't know because it's a battle that they put their hand in and then their hand gets sucked into the elbow. I mean, it's like a case in western Pennsylvania we just did on longwall coal mining. You know, the lawyers for the coal companies can brief 
you know, these legal briefs of 300 pages when it's just about coal. They can talk about sulfur content, how it's good for the economy in the United States, and we need more energy and all this kind of stuff, as long as it's about coal. But when it starts to get into decision-making rights, and the folks in the community say, hey, wait a minute, you know, since birth, we've had this IV drip in our arm that the United States is the best country on the planet, and the founding fathers are the best people that ever trod the earth, and we have this constitution that's supposed to be about democracy. How come we can't make decisions in our own community about what our community looks like in 20, 40, or 60 years? And it's that stuff that we're starting to have conversations with judges about, which is making the corporate boys very uncomfortable. Because they're okay when it's about commodifying a public resource. They've got that down, because they've been doing it for 100 years. They know it, and the lawyers know it, and the law firms get paid very well to do it, and they have dental. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're at a point where the question is, how do you change the rules of the game? So we're not talking about, we don't have to become experts on the nuclear fuel cycle or about, you know, fissures and limestone and how much recharge the aquifer has. That's great stuff to know, but we lose when we get mired in that kind of stuff. We have to know some of that stuff anyway. But let's talk about the real stuff that matters, which is who governs and who makes decisions in our communities. Because right now, there's an area of decision making that has been reserved outside of our ability to decide it. And it's reserved to something called the private market, you know, corporations, corporate stuff, economics. It's all that material. And we can leave it. We can let it sit in the closet. But if you do, we're screwed. Because we won't be able to say what happens to our communities and the places that we love uh, in the future. And if we can't say that, how do we build sustainable communities? How do we build downtowns that are vibrant if we can't say no to Walmart coming in? It's as simple as that. How do we have water to drink if we can't control Nestle from coming in and sucking out 350,000 gallons of water per day to ship to Italy for a bottling operation? How can we possibly build the types of communities that we need to build if we're in that structure of law? And it means breaking out of it. And that's difficult. It's the toughest work we've ever been involved with because it goes against everything we've learned or everything we think we know about this country. And I've watched people get stopped by their brains because when we go into some areas, and some of the legislators did it in New Hampshire, oh, yeah. they said, well, you can't do that because of X, and you can't do that because of Y. It's like we stop ourselves. We're so good at it. We almost don't need Nestle because we stop ourselves from even imagining what it looks like. And then we have to go up against all the experts. You're a municipal lawyer. Every municipality has a lawyer. He's a problem because he's there to make sure the municipality doesn't get sued. And he's there to advise them what the law is, not the, what the law should be. And so we've had, to over, we've had to roll over 100 different sets of solicitors over the past 10 years to say it's not about what the law is. It's about what it needs to be because otherwise we can't do what we, what we do within our community. It's got to go from the local and 10,000 communities standing up and saying, we're not going to do this anymore, to the state to actually redesign the state constitution to build in an inalienable right to local self-government, to then to the federal. We barely even talk about the federal because we're barely at the state. But eventually, all these places have to come together and change the federal constitution. It's an archaic document. It was written in the 1780s. It's about putting certain values above other values. And when people talk about loving the Constitution, I know I'm ranting, I'm almost yeah, done. Yeah, okay. So when people talk about loving the Constitution, they're usually talking about loving the Bill of Rights. That's what they mean. They say, oh, I love the Constitution. Well, yeah, it's the Bill of Rights and the 14th Amendment and what people had to fight to get in, leaving aside the fact the Bill of Rights was never part of the original document. The original boys didn't want it there. Madison fought to keep it out. The states had to force it in. And so let's keep the good stuff, but let's change the bad stuff like the Commerce Clause, which allows Waste Management Corporation to come in and sue communities when they deal with issues of commerce, like water. Water is commerce now under the U.S. Constitution. So there's a lot of changes that have to be made. It's like the DNA of this country has to be changed. And I don't know where else to start with that, except that people most affected in the communities affected by that decision-making structure are going to be the ones that lead the way to change it because people are running out of options. They can't turn to the regulatory system. They understand what it is. And there's a lot of amazing stuff that's starting to happen, but it's got to start from the local level and work its way up.